Thanks, Gary. Um, I'm going to continue with the uh, shark effect where we left off last night. Uh, the point was we were looking at the uh, ground state of the hydrogen atom in the presence of an, elect an external electric field. And we found that the uh, perturbative shift in the energy level was zero, meaning that there's no permanent electric dipole moments. However, there is a first order shift in the wave function, which is given by the standard formula here. Here's the ground state wave function, and here's the correction in the presence of the field. It's a linear combination of all states other than the ground state. So these are all states orthogonal to the ground state, with coefficients that come out of perturbation theory. And then from that, we establish the psi around the z component of the dipole operator, which is minus ez. And uh, the uh, result was is that we got a, an answer, a non-zero answer, showing that in the presence of the electric field, there actually is a, is a dipole moment uh, to the ground state of the hydrogen atom. Uh, not a permanent dipole moment, but as we say, it's an induced dipole moment. The induced dipole moment is proportional to the electric field. Well, this is a common situation in, uh, in, uh, in physics in which the uh, dipole moment is proportional to the applied field. F here is the electric field. And the proportionality factor alpha is just called the polarizability. It's just the, the, the ratio between those two. Um, so one of the results of this is that it's possible to obtain the polarizability alpha for the ground state of hydrogen from uh, first principles, basically working with quantum mechanics. And uh, it turns out to be uh, 2 e squared s, where s is the sum, which appears here. S just stands for sum. I rearranged it, re re rearranged it slightly so that the denominator is positive and so the sum s is positive. Is also positive. OK. So um, the, um, this uh, polarizability of the hydrogen atom can be used to compute the a dielectric constant. Uh, well, first of all, the electric susceptibility and then the dielectric constant. Uh, the polarization vector in matter is defined as the uh, net dipole moment per unit volume. And so if we have hydrogen atoms and each one has a dipole moment d, which is alpha times f, then the, the dipole moment per unit volume is equal to the number of atoms per unit volume, which I'll call n here, just multiplied times alpha f. So n here is a uh, number of atoms per unit volume. And uh, on the other hand, the proportionality between the polarization and the electric field is usually denoted by chi e. That's the uh, electric susceptibility. And so what you see is, as you would expect, the like electric susceptibility is proportional to the density of the gas. But uh, the proportionality factor is the polarizability of a single atom. And in this, in this manner, you see, you can compute the electric susceptibility. And then from that, the dielectric constant epsilon is 1 plus 4 pi chi e. Uh, like this. Now, this is not a very realistic calculation of a, of a dielectric constant from first principles because uh, normally speaking, you don't have a gas of hydrogen atoms. You have a gas of hydrogen molecules. So this is actually rather unrealistic. But at least it gives you an outline of the idea of what you'd use in a more realistic case. You'd have to analyze a molecule, or if it were helium, where you'd have single atoms, you'd have to analyze a two electron atom. And the basic procedure would follow just what we've done here. It's based on the Stark effect. All right. And similarly, one can compute magnetic, magnetic susceptibilities uh, in a similar manner. All right. Now, as long as we're still talking about the, uh, once we're talking about the ground state of hydrogen, there's one other thing we can do here, which is that uh, since we've discovered that the, uh, that the uh, first order energy shift vanishes because of parity, uh, let's go on the second order perturbation theory and see if we get an energy shift in second order. So let's write this energy shift in this way. It's delta E with a 1, 0, 0 subscript. That refers to the ground state. And I'll put a 2 in parentheses up here to indicate second order perturbation theory. If you apply the standard results from second order perturbation theory for this problem, uh, it becomes a sum over all states in LM, which are not equal to the ground state, because that's the one you're perturbing. And then you get a matrix element, a pair of matrix elements. It's 1, 0, 0 on the left, the perturbing Hamiltonian in the middle, and then NLM on the right. And then the same matrix element repeated backwards. It's complex conjugate, in other words, 1, 0, 0. These matrix elements are really real, so the complex conjugate doesn't matter. But I'll write them in this, in this order anyway, because it makes it look nice. And then it's divided by an energy denominator, which is E1 minus Ten. These are the unperturbed energy levels. They depend only on the principal quantum number N. 
Now, if you allow me to fix this up slightly, the H1 here is the same as EFZ, where F is the electric field strength and Z is the coordinate of the electron. The other H1 is the same, this is EFZ. And uh, as far as the denominator goes, the denominator is negative, so let me write it as minus EN minus E1 like this. Uh, the energies are an increasing function of the principal quantum number, so EN minus E1 is a positive number. Notice that it's never zero because we're excluding the we're excluding the state uh, in, in question that's being perturbed. That was the point of this, re this resolvent operator we introduced in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in balanced state perturbation theory was to avoid the small denominators. <coughs> All right, anyway, this is just a standard expression from a, a plot of second order, excuse me, of, of, uh, of, uh, of yeah, second order, second order non-degenerate perturbation theory. The one zero zero level is non-degenerate uh, applied to this particular problem. <coughs> Now, the same sum that appeared in the, in the construction of the, uh, of the, di the, 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 uh, the dipole moment, and, and hence the polarizability, what I'm calling S here, is now appearing again in the second order energy shift. The only difference is that I've got Zs here in the sum, and here I've got extra factors. So in fact, this whole thing turns into a factor of DF taken twice, so it's E squared S squared. And then a minus sign from the denominator, and what's left over is the same sum S like this. So this is the expression for the second order energy shift, and you see it's non-zero. The energy shift of first order is zero, but in second order we find a non-zero energy shift. This energy shift is negative, by the way. That's a general feature that whenever you do a, a, a perturbation, uh, effects of perturbation on the ground state of the system, if it's a non-degenerate ground state, and if the first order energy shift vanishes, then the second order energy shift is always negative. That's because the denominator here is the square of the matrix element and is always positive, and the numerator is always a excuse me, the, the numerator is always positive and the denominator is always negative, so the overall shift is negative. Uh, as far as the sum is concerned, we can re-express it in terms of the polarizability. S is just alpha over 2 e squared. And if you put those together, what you get is, is that the second order energy shift delta E2 of the ground state of hydrogen is equal to minus one half the polarizability times F squared. <coughs> like this, excuse me. <coughs> so this is the first non-vanishing shift of the energy of the ground state. And as you see, it goes as the square of the applied electric field. And for that reason, this is called a quadratic Stark effect. A quadratic Stark effect exists when the linear Stark effect doesn't, and the ground state of hydrogen is one of the easiest cases to analyze when you get this. <coughs> All right. Now, uh, there's a couple more things that I want to say about, um, about uh, this calculation. Uh, uh, one of them is that it's obvious that in order to evaluate numerically the, uh, the polarizability of the hydrogen atom, it's necessary to do this sum, which is an infinite sum, infinite, sums over an infinite number of terms, so it looks pretty hard. In fact, it's even worse than it looks because the NLM here, this is really a schematic notation, the NLM sum here, as you see, it, it kind of comes from a resolution of the identity, which is apparent up here in the numerator. That's where it came from, this resolvent operator. Uh, although one term is excluded. Um, but if you want a resolution of the identity, you have to include the continuum states in hydrogen as well as the bound states. So this is really a schematic expression and it should be understood to include an integral over the, uh, over the continuous spectrum of the, of, the, uh, of the unbound states as well as their L and M quantum numbers. So it's overall actually a rather complicated expression. One would have to know the unbound energy eigenfunctions for hydrogen as well as the bound ones so just, just to do this by a brute force method. Um, it turns out that there's, there is, however, an approximation to this. We can get a, a, a bound on this that's not so hard to work out. It works in the following way. I'll, I'll do what I can right down here below here, and then I'll probably switch to another board and cover this up. It works in the following way is that the denominator En minus E1 uh, depends on n, and that's what makes this sum hard is the denominator. However, since the energies are an increasing function of n, this is always greater than or equal to uh, E2 minus E1. Uh, this is for the case that n equals 2, 3, 4, and so on. Those are the only n's that occur in the sum. And so the denominator is, is always larger than a certain uh, quantity which is uh, independent of n, constant. 
or if we take the reciprocal of this, we get 1 over En minus E1 is less than 1 over E2 minus E1. And so I'm going to have to cover this up in just a moment, but it means that if I put this in, then I can get a bound on S. S will be less than the sum we get if we just replace this denominator by E2 minus E1. So there's the formula. Now I have to cover it up, uh, and here's what we're going to get. So we're going to get that S, the sum, is less than 1 over E2 minus E1 times the sum over these states. And then the matrix element is 1, 0, 0, with a Z in here, and then NLM, and then an NLM matrix, same matrix element, but backwards, 1, 0, 0, like this, and the denominator is going to remove. Now, in this sum, we, uh, we excluded the case that NLM equals 1, we exclude the ground, the ground state from the sum. Uh, that's because we had to back here, because otherwise you'd have, you'd have a divergent denominator, the zero denominator. Uh, however, once I've pulled out this constant denominator, then what's left over doesn't have any problems with that. Then we can actually now include the 1, 0, 0 term, because that term is 0 anyway. It vanishes by parity. So in other words, we can now take this sum over all values of NLM. And if we do this, including the integral over the continuum, then what you have here is a nice resolution of the identity. And the whole thing becomes 1 over E2 minus E1. Uh, times the uh, matrix element 1, 0, 0, uh, sandwiched around the operator z squared, because there's a z here and a z there. <coughs> well, this is a non-zero matrix element, and if you plug in the wave functions, you can evaluate it, and it turns into the square of four radius. As far as the e2 minus e1 goes, e2 minus e1 is uh, minus a half, and then it's at E squared over A naught, which is the characteristic energy of hydrogen. And then we have 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over minus 1, which is 1 over 1 squared, like this. And if you allow me to bring the minus sign inside, it becomes minus, minus a quarter plus a 1. That makes 3 quarters times a half is 3 eighths. The whole thing becomes 3 eighths at E squared over A naught. And so plugging this in with the A naught squared here, the reciprocal of this, what we find is that our sum is less than uh, 8 thirds uh, times uh, eight, A naught cubed divided by E squared. And so it's an upper bound on this sum S. And um, if we look at our uh, polarizability, which is 2 E squared times S, we get us an upper bound on the polarizability. We find that alpha is less than 16 thirds uh, A naught cubed which is a rather simple result to obtain for the polarizability of, of the ground state of hydrogen. Uh, 16 thirds is about 5.33. Uh, it turns out there's an exact analysis of this sum. It's possible to do the sum exactly. I won't take you through it. But if you do, what you find is the exact value of alpha is 9 halves A0 cubed. And 9 halves is about 4.5. So this upper bound is not too bad. Uh, but the point is, is that, uh, is that by uh, doing some work, we can actually get it. It's a simple formula for the polarizability of, of hydrogen in the ground state. And then, and then from this, we get the shift in the energy, which is alpha over is minus sign minus alpha over 2, the square of the electric field, useful result for some applications. Okay, so this is the quadratic Stark effect. <coughs> now, um, there's a couple more things that I'd like to say about, uh, so this is, this is what I want to say about the ground state of, of hydrogen uh, in the Stark effect. There's a couple more things I want to say about this whole, this whole business, however. Um, let me remind you that we did some searching around for uh, cases where there would be a linear Stark effect and therefore a permanent electric dipole moment. And we, first of all, we showed that, that such a thing did not exist in any uh, non-degenerate eigenstate. Uh, of hydrogen or the alkali because um, then the perturbation is sandwiched between states of definite parity. <coughs> parity uh, so then we looked at excited states of the alkali where you have uh, where you have uh, degenerate states. And we found that there still is no non-zero uh, uh, permanent electric dipole moment because all of those states, all of those excited states of the alkali are again eigenstates of parity. Now the question arises, we finally found an example where it does work in hydrogen because we had a degeneracy 
because of this extra symmetry in hydrogen, we have a degeneracy between states with different L values. And in central force problems, they parity in states minus 1 to the L. So uh, central force eigenstates for a fixed L all have definite parity. And unless you mix, mix together different L's, which is what happens in hydrogen, but not elsewhere, uh, you won't get an, a permanent electric dipole moment. Uh, I'd like to make a, a few comments now about how this generalizes to other systems. Uh, this was only an electrostatic model of hydrogen or the alkalis. It didn't include uh, relativistic effects, uh, spin, hyperfine, all kinds of other small effects were admitted. The question might be, if we include those effects, would we find, would, would it be possible to find a permanent electric dipole moment? Or maybe turn it into a multi-particle system. There's a lot of, a lot of generalizations. So I'd like to generalize this question because it has to do with the question about parity as a good quantum number in, 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 in more complex systems. So here's a general idea. Let's suppose we have a, a system so you can think of a, an atom, a molecule, or a nucleus. It could be quite complicated. So, but it has some Hamiltonian, I'll call h naught, And we'll assume that it commutes with parity, which in fact is uh, means, which in fact is always true if you neglect the weak interactions, which is an extremely good approximation in most cases. So we'll just assume that it commutes with parity, but otherwise we won't say much about H0. Uh, well, we'll also assume that it's isolated. What that means is that it also commutes with J squared and JZ. So that means that it's the collection of operators, I'll just take an H instead of H0. The collection of operators, H, J squared, and JZ, are a commuting set. And uh, it means that uh, we can, first of all, diagonalize J squared and JZ. And then inside each of those eigenspaces, we can diagonalize H. And if we do, what we get is a set of uh, states that we can label by three quantum numbers like this. If we let the Hamiltonian act on this, this brings out an energy, which the new basically is just a sequencing number for the energy levels. This will bring out an energy E nu J on this state nu J M, like this. The energy does not depend on M because of the rotational invariance of the system. <clears throat> this is just a generalization of what happens in central force motion, um, <clears throat> whereas we would use the symbol N, N for the principal quantum number instead of nu. The basic structure of, this, of these eigenstates applies for any of these systems. All right. <clears throat> now, uh, one question is whether there might be any energy degeneracies for different values of nu and j, that is to say, for different values of nu and j, is it possible that different energies would coincide? That's what they do in hydrogen, where you've got, for example, the 2s and 2p at the same energy. That, however, is a very exceptional case. A general rule about degeneracies is they don't happen unless there's some, um, unless there's some symmetry that makes them happen. <coughs> Most systems don't have any symmetry beyond the obvious symmetry. That's what's being in, 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 in used here is the rotational symmetry to write down these states. We'll talk about parity in a moment. But there isn't any, for most systems, there isn't any extra symmetry around. And so the result is, is that in, in most realistic systems, the energies E nu J, in fact, are, are non-degenerate. Well, they have the degeneracy in M. That's always the case. But they don't have any extra degeneracy beyond that. The degeneracy in M means you've got two J plus one states. Let me remind you of the iron 57 nucleus, which start, has a, a ground state of I equals 1 half. This is 57 iron like this. There's an excited state I'll call star that has I equals 3 halves. And this is the 14 kV transition that's oftentimes used for the loss power effect. And then there's another doubly excited state that has I equals 5 halves. And the point is, is that these states of iron are, are characterized, there's transitions like this and also like this, is that these states in iron are characterized by an angular momentum quantum number. That's like the J here. And they have a degeneracy where the M runs from minus I to plus I. I here is the standard symbol for the, the nuclear spin. But there isn't any degeneracy between these. These states are these states, these different in these different states with different the new here, the new here basically is the number of stars, one, two, just labels these states. And um, there's no degeneracy amongst them. All right. So now the question is, uh, what about parity? Are these of these uh, energy eigenstates also going to be eigenstates of parity. Because if they are, then there won't be any linear Stark effect. So let's analyze this question. Let's consider what parity does to one of these states mu J M. Let's let parity act on one of these energy eigenstates. 
Well, this is also an energy eigenstate itself, because if I let H act on it, since H commutes with parity, I bring it through, and it's going to bring out an E new J, like this. I do have pi new J here. In fact, it's a eigenstate uh, of energy with the same eigenvalue. But if there's no degeneracy amongst different new J values, then the only degeneracy that remains is the M values. So the energy eigenstates with this given eigenvalue are just the 2j plus 1 that come from varying m. And therefore, pi nu j m, since it has an energy dj, e nu j, must be a linear combination, sum over m prime, which states nu j m prime. They must be a linear combination of vectors that lie in the same irreducible subspace, which is the energy eigenspace, with some coefficients I'll call c sub m prime here, and you can be the coefficients. That's a J here, not a new prime. This. Actually, these coefficients will also depend on the M value of the state that you let pi act on, at least as far as we know when we first write this equation down. Now, to find out more about these coefficients, let's sort of sandwich on the other side with, uh, with the, the same new and the same J, but an M prime. And what we get is the matrix elements of the parity operator inside the single irreducible subspace. And this just turns into these coefficients C, M prime, M, like this. Just, that's just what the coefficients are, the matrix elements of the parity operator. The parity operator, however, is a scalar operator. It commutes with all rotations. And as a result, its matrix elements inside a single irreducible subspace are just some number C that's independent of M times a chronic or delta in M prime. This comes from the bigger Eckhart theorem. And uh, what that means is the matrix of the parity operator inside this area of useful subspace is a multiple of the identity of the constant C factor. <coughs> and that means that all of the new JMs, which are new and J fixed but M variable, they're all eigenstates of parity with some eigenvalue that's called C here. And the eigenvalues of parity are, are plus or minus, one or the other. But whichever it is, a plus one or a minus one, it's the same value for all of the, all of the different M values. And the conclusion of this is, is that these energy eigenstates, which have this, this 2j plus 1 fold degeneracy, unless by some miracle there's a, there's a degeneracy for different values of nu and j, which usually doesn't happen, this will also be an eigenstate of parity, which states of definite parity. And so, for example, if you look at energy level tables of energy levels and nuclear energy levels, they'll not, not only give the spin, but they'll also give the parity of the states. These are, these are all definite, definite eigenstates of parity. The same is true of various elementary particles, excitations, baryon, the baryon excitations, and so on, and the, the um, lambda and delta particles and things of that sort. There are all the eigenstates of parity as well as angular momentum. These are the basic quantum numbers that they characterize in energy eigenstates of almost any uh, isolated system. I say almost any because the one exception is hydrogen, when you have this accidental but extra degeneracy. All right. Now, and then, of course, since there are eigenstates of parity, there's no linear Stark effect, and hence no, no, no uh, permanent dipole moment for these states, even if they are degenerate. Okay, now, having said all that, then, um, if you've ever taken a course in chemistry, this raises a question which I'd not like to address. Because in chemistry, they tell you uh, that there are certain molecules they call polar molecules, which carry a permanent electric dipole moment. And I see somebody stole my eraser again, so I'll have to be right back to see if I find a filter car here. The eraser has shrunk, this will have to do. Uh, the, uh, they stole the good eraser, and that's a bad one. The, uh, so they tell you in chemistry class that uh, molecules that are uh, typically molecules like uh, like uh, hydrogen chloride is an example, but in fact it applies to any heteronuclear diatomic molecule. Uh, they tell you that these are uh, polar molecules, so they carry a uh, there's a charge separation in them, and so they carry a, a dipole moment vector like this, a permanent dipole moment. <clears throat> and then you might have done problems in step neck where you take something that has a dipole moment vector and you have an energy delta E, which is minus, minus the dipole moment vector down to the electric field, and then you carry out the step mechanism to find the orientation of, say, in, 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 in thermal equilibrium. 
average orientation and so energy and orientation and so on. So how can I reconcile this permanent electric dipole moment with this analysis I gave up above, which says that energy energy levels of, of real realistic isolated systems almost never have an electric dipole electric dipole moment, the exception being the United States of hydrogen. How do we reconcile this? The answer is this: is that the the analysis I gave above was was true, was correct. That uh, as long as there's no degeneracies amongst the different e nu j's or different values of nu and j, then then you uh, then each of these states are eigenstates of parity. However, it is possible that different e nu j's could come very close together in energy and be nearly degenerate. But then, if you apply an electric field which is strong enough to sort of overwhelm the the, the small splitting between these levels, they will then start to behave. As if they are, they are practically speaking, they become degenerate, and you start to achieve a, a dipole moment that is, that is effectively a permanent dipole moment. It involves mixing of states of opposite parity. Um, and um, so, this is what happens in the case of diatomic molecules: is that it's true that the uh, that the electron distribution around the two atoms has a charge separation. Think of this as, it would be useful to think of this as a, as a dumbbell with a positive and negative charges at the two ends of the dumbbell. This is an example of the diatomic molecule almost rigid body, which I gave a lecture on earlier in the semester. However, if you look at the total wave function, the total wave function is multiplied by a YLM. And this gives a parity of the state, which is minus one to the L. Now what happens is, is that, so in other words, it's not just pointing in some direction in space, but it's effectively averaged over all angles in a manner that's, that's indicated by the YLMs. Now, if you then take the expectation value of the dipole moment vector over the YLM, what you find is that it's zero. It is zero, just like, I, just like I've been saying. On the other hand, in going from one L to the next L, the parity changes because it goes like minus one to the L. These are the different rotational energy states of the molecule. And these rotational energy states are, are separated by, as I also explained this, they're separated by energies that are down in the microwave, far infrared microwave regime. So what you've got is a, is a series of, of rotational energy levels as a function of L, and they alternate plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, and so on in parity. And if you now put them in a magnetic field which is strong enough to overwhelm this small splitting between neighboring energy levels, you'll get significant <coughs> mixing of the, of the positive and negative parity states. And then it will start to behave as if it really does have Permanent electric dipole moment, uh, and so this is how this is how this is what justifies these kind of statements they make in chemistry classes. But to be rigorous about it, for weak electric fields, you don't get a you don't get a, a permanent dipole moment. They really have a quadratic stark effect for weak fields. It becomes linear later on when the field becomes strong enough to overwhelm the splitting. By the way, even in hydrogen, this applies. Because this degeneracy, this accidental degeneracy that happens in hydrogen, where the 2s and the 2p are exactly degenerate, they're exactly degenerate only in the electrostatic model of hydrogen. If you start adding very small effects in hydrogen, you find that this degeneracy is lifted as well. And so even in hydrogen, it's not true that you have exact <coughs> degeneracy between states, uh, uh, between uh, different uh, irreducible multiples in the rotations. Okay, well that's all I want to say about uh, the Stark effect. It was partly an excuse to make some uh, general points about parity as well as talking about the Stark effect. Um, and I'd like to turn now to a new subject, which is the fine structure. And uh, for simplicity, we'll once again talk about uh, the case of hydrogen and alkali atoms. So the physics of fine structure is that it's the concerns the effects of spin and relativity on the structure of the atom. Uh, so we'll be dealing with a, a, an unperturbed Hamiltonian, which is p squared over 2m plus v of r. So this is an electrostatic model. And the v of r will be, we'll not just do hydrogen, we'll do hydrogen-like atoms as well, we'll put in the z dependence. So this is for h-like atoms. And as usual, there's no, no simple formula for the case of the alkalis. And you should know what, they, what roughly the potential looks like. Anyway, so this is the electrostatic model. Um, so as I said, the perturbation we want to consider here is the fine structure perturbation, which concerns the effects of relativity and spin. 
It turns out that there are three terms uh, that occur here, and they're all of the same order of magnitude. So for a realistic treatment, you have to take them all together. Uh, and these are, <coughs> the first one is what I'll call the relativistic kinetic energy correction, HRKE. The second one is called the Darwin term. And the third one is the spin orbit term, which we've talked about already. Uh, so I don't need to say too much about that. The fact that all three of these are the same order of magnitude is an indication that spin, in a certain sense, is a relativistic effect. It's a relativistic effect that sometimes, that, in, that is oftentimes incorporated into non-relativistic quantum mechanics by, in an ad hoc manner, by adding extra terms to the Schrodinger equation. This is what's normally done, for example, in condensed matter physics. But from a more fundamental standpoint, spin really re reflects relativistic effects, and the deeper understanding of spin has to come out of the relativistic theory. Yes. Yes, I might have missed this point, but when you were talking about, when you said that HCl has a permanent, the behavior has a permanent electric dipole, but, but, but that, as opposed to induced, so if you are talking about it happening on the, in the presence of an external electric field, then why would it be permanent? It is, strictly speaking, it's not permanent because in, in the absence of the electric, uh, any external electric field, there is no, there is no dipole moment. These YLMs average out the direction of the, of the, I mean, it's true the electronic wave function is a charge separation, but it's, it's, like a, it's like a charged dumbbell. But the YLMs average this out over all angles so that the average, the, the, the a average, which is what you call the dipole moment, is zero. So it's induced in the energy eigenstate for the isolated molecule. Uh, how, and what that means, in turn, is that if you apply a weak electric field, you see only a quadratic Stark effect. The energy only increases quadratically in the field. However, when the, when the field strength gets large enough, it'll start producing strong mixing between neighboring states and the neighboring L values. And they're pretty close together in the case of molecules. They're in fairly low energies. And so, beyond a certain field strength, which you can calculate, I think it's some hundred volts per centimeter. It's actually not all that small. You start to get uh, strong mixing of, of states of opposite parity. They're, they're neighboring L, L values in the rotational spectrum. And beyond that, the dependence of the energy on the applied field becomes linear rather than quadratic. It's a transition from a quadratic to a linear regime. And so beyond that, it actually behaves as if there's a, as if there's a first order Stark effect. Does that help? Okay. All right. Uh, and then you, know, then you can talk. Uh, yeah, so then, so then in, in effect, it becomes like a permanent electric dipole moment. And the, and the energy in the field becomes minus d dot e, where the d is the permanent electric dipole moment. All right. OK, so to go back to the fine structure, then there are three fine structure terms, uh, relativistic kinetic energy, Darwin term, and the spin orbit term. What I'd like to indicate is, 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 as best I can, uh, within the framework of uh, non-relativistic mechanics, uh, or a non-relativistic or Schrodinger equation, uh, what these terms mean physically. Uh, the first one, the relativistic kinetic energy, is probably the easiest one to work with. In relativity, the total energy of the system, uh, which we now think of as being rest mass plus kinetic energy, is given by the square root of m squared c to the fourth plus c squared p squared. This is a function of momentum. And this is the same thing, factoring out mc squared uh, times one plus momentum p divided by mc quantity squared. And if we write this out, expand this out in a Taylor series, this becomes mc squared times 1 plus 1 half p over mc quantity squared minus 1 eighth if I carry it out to uh, fourth order of the momentum p over mc to the fourth, like this. <laughs> And now multiplying this together, the first term is the rest mass, and the next term becomes p squared over 2m, which is the usual uh, non-relativistic expression for the kinetic energy. And then the next correction term is p to the fourth divided by 8 uh, m cubed c, c squared, like this, and we stop there. And so the, uh, if we call the kinetic energy the contribution to the energy beyond the rest mass, then it's everything all the, uh, all the terms of the series beyond, beyond the second one. In other words, it's a non-relativistic kinetic energy uh, term, but there's also this first relativistic correction. And in fact, this is the expression for the relativistic kinetic energy, HRKE, is equal to minus uh, P to the fourth divided by H mass cubed times C squared. 
this is actually, I'll write this in a slightly different form. It's minus 1 over 2 mc squared times p squared over 2m quantity squared. So it's, so it's proportional to the square of the non-relativistic kinetic energy divided by twice mc squared. So that term is fairly easy to understand, and it's plausible that something like this should appear if you're interested in relativistic corrections. Uh, to make a slight tangent, uh, let me say some things about relativity in atomic physics. I pointed out earlier uh, in uh, my lecture on hydrogen atom that the velocity of the electron in the ground state of the hydrogen atom, its characteristic velocity, uh, is uh, the fine structure constant alpha times the speed of light. So it's approximately c over 137. Uh, <coughs> this is uh, pretty fast, but it's uh, still a uh, uh, Pretty, uh, also pretty substantial non-relativistic. Non uh, when you uh, compute uh, differences in energies, they, uh, relativistic energies, they typically go like the velocity squared. And so uh, v squared, you see, goes like something like, um, or mv squared, well, v squared. v squared goes like something like, uh, goes like something like, well, let's say v over c squared make it dimensionless, goes like alpha squared, which is something like 10 to the minus 4. So in hydrogen, you'd expect the corrections due to relativity to be something like 10 to the minus 4 compared to the basic energy, uh, energy scale of the, uh, of the electrostatic Coulomb model. On the other hand, if you go to hydrogen-like atoms, in which the nuclear charge is increased by a factor of z, then the characteristic velocity goes up to z also to get z times c over 137. If you go all the way to the uranium, this is something like about two-thirds the speed of light. And so in the case of uranium, relativistic corrections are actually quite important, at least for uh, the electrons that are down in the K-shell, that's certainly true. <laughs> um, so um, anyway, this gives you some idea of relativistic corrections. They're they're small of the order of 10 to the minus 4 of hydrogen, but this is something that grows as z squared and becomes more important as you move to heavier atoms. And this will certainly be true of this relativistic kinetic energy correction here. All right. Now, um, as far as the, the, the remaining two terms, this is the Darwin term and the spin orbit term. Let me just deal with the spin orbit term first. And all I'm going to do is write it down because we talked about earlier what it means. And uh, here's what it is. The spin orbit term h spin orbit is equal to, uh, it's uh, 1 over 2 twice m squared c squared times uh, 1 over the radius r times dv dr times l dot s. And just to remind you, this physically represents the magnetic energy of interaction of the electron spin with the magnetic field as seen in the electron rest frame. There is no magnetic field in the lab frame, the frame of the nucleus. There's only the Coulomb field in the nucleus. But that's an electric field. And by Lorentz transformation, you get a magnetic field when you go to the rest frame of the electron. I went through this before, so I won't elaborate on it. But this is the spin orbit correction. And this, is, this turns out to be the same order of magnitude. This is all just a kinetic energy. Finally, there's the Darwin correction, the Darwin term. The Darwin term is very difficult to explain even uh, hand -wave, in a hand-waving manner uh, within a non-relativistic framework. Uh, it really comes out of the Dirac equation. Uh, I think the best I can do is to, is to I'll do the best I can. Uh, it turns out that in the relativistic Dirac theory of the electron, that if you, if you, uh, if you in effect, force the Dirac equation into the mole of the Schrodinger equation, what you find is, is that the electron, in effect, interacts with the, uh, with the electric field, the Coulomb field of the nucleus in this case. It interacts with the electric field in a somewhat non-local manner. Uh, it, it is as if the electron is smeared out over a certain radius, uh, which uh, uh, has a scale length which is of the order of the Compton wavelength, which I call lambda c. Let me say something about the Compton wavelength, because it's a basic, uh, it's a basic quantity that is relevant for relativistic quantum mechanics. The physics of it's really very simple. Uh, if we have a particle and we put it in a box of size L, like this, uh, as you know, there's a uh, uncertainty in the momentum delta P, which is at the order of H bar divided by L. And so as you, if you imagine squeezing the box in and making it narrower, then the delta P increases and there's more greater uncertainty in the momentum. Now let's ask ourselves how much, to, how much, how tightly do we have to squeeze the box before the momentum starts to take on relativistic values? 
Well, if that's a relativistic value, a typical relativistic value for the momentum would be the mass times the speed of light. So this gives us an estimate then for L, and what we find then is that L is equal to h bar divided by mc. This, in fact, is the definition of the Compton wavelength lambda c. As you see, it depends on the mass of the particle, and lighter particles have larger Compton wavelengths than, than heavier ones. In the case of the electron, which is what we're mainly interested in here, the Compton wavelength, h, h bar over mc for the, for the electron, uh, is, in fact, equal to the Bohr radius a, a naught, which I'll call a naught, multiplied times the fine structure constant, the square root of h bar c, which is about 1 over 137. You know, the Compton wavelength for the electron is a factor of alpha down from the, from the scale length of the, uh, of the size of the standard size of the hydrogen atom. It's down by a factor of 137. And so on this scale length, less than a percentage of one percent or so of the size of the hydrogen atom, relative domestic effects start to be important in the case of the electron. And this smearing out that I was speaking about, which lies behind the Darwin effect, takes place over a scale length, which is precisely this constant wavelength. Because of this smearing out, it turns out the electron interacts with a, uh, with a potential V, not only by the potential at the evaluated position of the, of the electron, the center of this blob, but also a correction term, a second order correction term, which is of the order of magnitude of the constant wavelength squared times the Laplacian of the potential. Things like this occur in classical elect elect electrostatics, too. You may have seen things about averaging things out over, over potentials. But anyway, it goes like the Laplacian. This is how it turns out. And so except for a factor of 1 8, that's exactly what the Darwin term is. It's the square of the Compton wavelength, which is h bar over mc, h bar squared over m squared c squared, multiplied times the Laplacian of the potential. And this is what you get for this. OK. So, um, so this is, uh, at best, just hand-waving derivations of these, of these three terms. Uh, these terms all of them come out automatically from the Dirac equation without doing any hand-waving things at all. And we'll do that in the, in the next semester. But for now, uh, what I'd like to do is just to use these three perturbation terms, basically as practice in perturbation theory, and also for gaining uh, some knowledge about the fine structure. Um, I mentioned that we'd be talking about both hydrogen-like atoms and alkalis. Actually, what I'd really like to do is just concentrate almost entirely on hydrogen-like atoms first, and when we're done with that, I'll come back and tell you about the alkalis. So, for the case of the hydrogen atom, let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the let, let's specialize to the case where the potential has this h-like form minus z-b squared over r. Uh, as far as this, as far as the Laplacian of the potential is concerned, the potential v. Is the, is the energy of the particle, but that's equal to the charge, which is minus E times the electrostatic potential. And the Laplacian of electrostatic potential by uh, Gauss's law is minus 4 pi times the charge density. This is the charge density which produces the potential phi. And the charge density, in turn, for a hydrogen-like atom is the nuclear charge Z times, times the unit electron, electron charge. Well, it's Z times the charge of the proton times the direct delta function of the origin, treating the nucleus as if it were a point particle. And so putting this together, what we get is a del squared V for the case of a hydrogen-like atom is equal to with a plus 4 pi Z V squared direct delta function of, of the, of the, of the uh, uh, three-dimensional direct delta function of the origin. And so uh, to combine this and, 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 and fill this in, and for the case of the hydrogen-like atom, the, the Darwin term becomes equal to pi over 2 times uh, z v squared uh, h bar squared divided by m squared c squared uh, times direct help function of r. Also, for the spin orbit term, it's easy enough to differentiate the potential dv dr here and divide by r and plug that in, and if you do, then here's what you get for the spin orbit term. It becomes z times e squared divided by uh, twice m squared c squared times 1 over r cubed times l dot s. And so here they are. Here's the three terms which we'll take for perturbations uh, on 
uh, on hydrogen like atoms and work these out and see what they do to the energy levels. Now, as usual in doing perturbation theory, before, uh, you should, before you start, you ought to understand the unperturbed system. The unperturbed system here is just an H-like atom, so we know a lot about that already. There's not too much to say. Um, if we, the, the unperturbed Hamiltonian is, is given up there. It's a purely orbital operator. And if you, if you ignore the spin completely, then you, you write the eigen, eigenspace in cat language like this, this is what we did in the, in the case of the Stark effect. Allow me to put an L subscript on the M to indicate that it's a magnetic quantum number associated with orbital angular momentum. Uh, the reason is that I'm bringing this up is because the affine structure terms, at least the spin orbit term does anyway, it involves the spin explicitly. So to take these uh, terms into account, we need to include the spin of the electron. Uh, so to do that, the basis states then for the, we need to, we need to uh, increase the size of the Hilbert space to include the spin as well. And the basis states and the enlarged Hilbert space are the product of the basis states and the orbital basis states times the spin basis states, which I'll write as S and S like this. And as a shorthand notation, let's write these basis spaces N, L, M sub L, M sub S, where I suppress the quantum number S because that's the spin of the electron and it's just constant in one, in one half. This is what we call the uncoupled basis uh, when we were doing, uh, 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 when we were doing uh, the coupling of angular momentum. This is the uncoupled basis. So the uncoupled basis is the is the uh, is is is, a, is n uh, is n or b or n eigenbasis of the unperturbed Hamiltonian, and since the unperturbed Hamiltonian doesn't involve the spin at all, the addition of the spin here didn't change the energies of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. It's still the standard electrostatic model energies, but what it did do is it doubled the degeneracy because the energy doesn't depend on the orientation of the spin m s up or m s down. And so now the degeneracies of the unperturbed system are, are, are two in squared instead of just n squared. Okay, so for that, there's not much change. Not much else to say about the un unperturbed system. Now, um, the um, two in squared is uh, never equal to one. So uh, these energy levels are degenerate. They're always degenerate. And uh, if we want to uh, add up these three fine structure terms and, uh, and uh, find their effect on the energy levels, we're going to have to use degenerate perturbation theory. So if I call, if I call the so H fine structure, here's kind of what we need to think about. Let's at least think about this at first. Uh, we want to form the matrix elements of the perturbing Hamiltonian inside one of the degenerate eigenspaces. The degenerate eigenspaces are determined since the energy, the unperturbed energies only depend on n. They're determined by the principal quantum number alone. So we'll have states nl, ml, and ms on one side, and nl, ml, and ms on the other side. Except I'll put primes on the l, ml, and ms. I don't put primes on the n's because that that labels the uh, the eigenspace of the unperturbed system the primes and everything else because they label the basis vectors inside the degenerate eigenspace of the unperturbed system. This is the basic strategy of degenerate perturbation theory. Um, before we get carried away, away with it, well, so this is going to be, as you see, it's going to be 2n squared by 2n squared dimensional matrix, and it, we might be intimidated by the diagonalizing such a big matrix. Before we get carried away with doing that, though, there's some rules uh, that I'd like to tell you about for uh, setting up, uh, in effect, choosing a good basis that saves labor. Um, allow me to, uh, instead of talking about H fine structure, allow me just write H1 here, where H1 is perhaps any one of these three fine structure terms that we're talking about here, and think about this kind of a matrix. I'd like to illustrate a certain principle. Let's suppose that H1 commutes with LZ. Let's suppose this is, this is true. This actually is true for these three cases here. Let's suppose this is true. Then if I take these two states and sandwich them around the commutator, I'm going to get zero. <coughs> if I get zero is equal to ML, ML, MS uh, with primes on it. And then I've got LZ times H1 minus H1 times LZ. And then we have ML, ML, MS on the other side, like this, which just follows from the commutator. 
Now the first LZ, I can allow to act to the left, and the second one I can allow to act to the right. So this brings out ML prime minus ML. And then what's left over is, is the matrix element of H1 alone. ML, ML, MS. The trouble with this subject is that it takes so long to write everything out. And so what you see is, is that either the matrix element of the Hamiltonian vanishes, or else the magnetic quantum numbers are equal. And what that means is that if, if the perturbing Hamiltonian here commutes with LC, then this is actually diagonal in the ML quantum number. This whole thing is proportional to delta ML time, ML prime. <coughs> and this actually applies not only, obviously not only for LC, but for the other quantum numbers like L squared and, 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 L sub, and, and S sub C, which are in here also. And it illustrates a general rule. We usually use uh, basis states, which are eigenstates of complete sets of commuting observables. That's what's being done here. If the operator whose matrix element you're taking commutes with one of the members of the complete set, then it means the matrix elements are diagonal in the corresponding quantum number. Well, if you're diagonal in the corresponding quantum number, you've already done some of the work of diagonalizing the matrix. If you're smart, you may, may be able to find a complete set of commuting observables such that all of the observables in the list commute with the operator in the middle. And if that's so, the whole matrix is diagonal. And then there's nothing to diagonalize. All you need to do is just compute the diagonal elements, and those will be the energy shifts. So that effectively converts degenerate perturbation theory into non-degenerate perturbation theory, which is much easier. You just, you just find expectation values of diagonal matrix elements. Okay, with that, I'll let go. Have a happy Thanksgiving, and uh, I'll see you on Monday.